So I work at Stylefoods. We are an uh, online fashion and interior design hub. We're on the uh, five European markets. Uh, and we used to be a uh, Ruby on Rails based company, but two years ago we migrated to Clojure. Um, and since then we're well, very happy with the language. Basically everything we do um, runs into Clojure. Um, some time ago a uh, new project emerged. We entered a new market. Um, we released our mobile applications. Uh, this posed a new challenge for the backend team, which I'm part of. Um, we needed to create a mobile API which would serve data over HTTP to our mobile devices. This posed a couple of challenges for us, a couple of decisions to make. Uh, one of them was uh, the language. Well, here the, the choice was quite obvious. Um, but other choices, such as architecture, such as deploying of uh, our new project, weren't that clear. Um, we set our expect expectations relatively high. We were aiming for a short feedback loop, um, so that introduced changes will end up on production as soon as possible, so we can evaluate, um, evaluate uh, their, 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 their results. We wanted to be able to continu continuously deliver straight from the master branch. Um, we wanted automated and uh, lightweight uh, deployments which were pauseless and not noticeable for our users even under load. And we also wanted high availability in, uh, in the situation of uh, failure of a node, as well as uh, ability to scale dynamically our, uh, our servers. Having these things in mind, we came up with a project which we called Ogrom. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Polish and related languages, it's like a lot of. Um, and um, I'd like to dedicate the rest of this talk uh, to, to Ogrom. Uh, the uh, talk is divided roughly into three parts. First, I will talk about architecture, then I will say, uh, say some details about how we are deploying it and how we are running it. Um, and um, then I will close up with some rest lessons we have learned while working on this project. So, um, let's start with architecture of this uh, REST-inspired HTTP API. As our experience showed us, well, it's obvious, but it took us a hard way to learn it, that using a functional programming language isn't the ultimate solution for all your architecture related problems. <laughs> um, it took us some time to learn it, and um, our experience led us to uh, clearly divide the architecture of this project into <coughs> four parts. Um, briefly, sources is a wrapper FSA for all of our external data sources and external databases. Core is where all the um, HTTP endpoints are defined. Protocols sets up a uh, protocol, a communication channel between those uh, two elements, and then run, binds them all together, and exposes a single HTTP interface. Uh, all of those projects are separate uh, closure projects, developed and released, as in, and versioned independently. But then, um, afterwards, they are running within a single JVM. Let's take a look at some details. Uh, protocols is the simplest one. Protocols um, is, is nothing but a set of uh, closure protocols or interfaces, if you like, which uh, define coarsely grained interactions with uh, data sources, with 
abstract data sources, like this simple protocol which defines uh, a function of having to fetch a collage by, by SP ID. Sources implement all of these protocols using various concrete data sources. In our case, that's MySQL, that's Elasticsearch, but also uh, Facebook API. Core is where the interesting part starts. Um, Core knows nothing about concrete data sources. It's implemented only in terms of those protocols. Each of our HTTP endpoints is uh, defined within Core as a separate independent entity, not just being aware of all the other endpoints within our application. Each core endpoint uh, has all of its dependencies injected. And, and by it, in dependencies, I mean um, actual data sources. Um, each endpoint is unaware of the uh, absolute path it's located in. All it knows is its uh, HTTP request method, like get, post, patch, and its um, and its path. I mean, um, I mean the post fix, the last part of the path. And uh, it's just a value. We can put it in uh, collections, nest it, which will uh, come quite useful soon. In order to implement these endpoints, we use an excellent library called uh, Liberator. Liberator is, is a tool allowing you to implement HTTP uh, protocol, completely forgetting about all the, all the uh, logic of transitions between various states of the HTTP protocol, the HTTP standard. What you define is logic which covers various um, the various uh, holes in the in the HTTP decision diagram. Here, for example, I have a um, resource called uh, product, which serves a single product, and uh, to key exists, I pass a function called find product or return nil. Um, when this endpoint is uh, serving an HTTP request. A liberator uses this function to determine whether a product exists or not, given the request parameters. Depending on what this function will return, it will either know that it should go into the direction of 200 status codes when the product exists, or 400 status codes when the product doesn't exist. And then, depending on where I will end up finally in the decision diagram, it will use handle OK, which in my case is render product to serve 200 OK status, and otherwise render error message, which will allow me to print some nice error message, and uh, well, Liberator will, will return uh, 404 status for me. This translates to the following decision diagram, a graph, which uh, allows you to forget about the control flow within your HTTP application and just fill in the important details about how your application should behave in certain, in certain stages, uh, which um, massively simplifies uh, implementation of endpoints and makes, makes it sort of declarative. Now we know more or less how are we implementing actual endpoints. Now let's take a look at how do we get to those endpoints, namely about routing. For routing, we use BD. That's how we pronounce the name of the library. Now, BD specifies HTTP routes using core mm, closure primitive, that is data structures. Plain old data structures. Um, it's typical in the, in the closure community. Here we see a simple example which shows us two paths, products and ratings, uh, both bound to some functions which I haven't defined in the slide, product and uh, ratings. Product and ratings in our case would be implemented using Liberator. And then BD, using this nested data structure, would be able to figure its way to which endpoint it should lead the request given it's um, the path that's specified by the client. And that's how all of the endpoints defined by uh, our application are, um, are exposed as BD routes, pointing to a liberator endpoints. Now let's take at run and see how it uh, binds all those things together. Run um, 
takes on one hand all of our sources, which you can see on the right side of the screen. That's the left side of the screen. Um, and um, instantiates them, passing all necessary connections to databases, to um, Elasticsearch, a um, connection pool to HTTP um, services, etc. And then um, injects all of sources into, into our endpoints. Mm. All the endpoints declare which sources they need to uh, perform what they're supposed to do. In this simple example, the last get comments endpoints needs uh, source of users and sort of source of comments to perform. And this way, we can easily inject uh, mocked simple uh, simple um, sources for testing uh, the endpoints without any uh, data. A database attached to them. We can simply pass in implementations of sources which are backed by items we heard about during the previous talk and see whether saving comments makes them appear in relevant items. After all of those um, uh, sources have been initialized and passed to um, endpoints, we, um, or rather, run thanks to the fact that um, all the endpoints are defined in terms of the plane of data structure routes. It just uses <coughs> core closure functions to merge them all together and build a whole graph of all of our, um, or other, it's not a graph, a tree of our um, endpoints, prefixing them with information such as version identifier of the um, API and the locale it's running on. We're serving five different locales, but we started with uh, Germany, I will get to a localization in a second. This allows uh, BD to serve incoming requests by going through this entire tree and getting the proper liberator endpoint which implements a particular, um, a particular resource. So the life, the life cycle of the request is um, finding itself in, in the routing logic where uh, BD finds a corresponding endpoint for you. Once it finds an endpoint, in this case it would be uh, posting to comments, it makes the endpoint logic implemented in terms of liberate or use the data sources, uh, users, product, and comments, uh, connect with uh, proper databases, do all the logic with which is necessary, and send back some meaningful response to back to the user. Thanks to the fact that we are injecting all the dependencies, there is no global uh, thread pool, there is no global uh, connection pool. Everything is injected directly into uh, sources and then into endpoints. Uh, thanks to this, we are able to run uh, our application as a completely independent uh, independent entity. We can store multiple of these within a single GPM. Uh, this proved to be quite useful. Uh, when we face any requirement after uh, initial success in um, Germany, we uh, were supposed to extend operations to remaining countries we're present mm -hmm. in, that is, uh, UK, France, Netherlands, and Poland. Mm -hmm. This uh, made us either choose this solution, which basically is uh, having separate um, infrastructure and separate configuration for multiple. Uh, multiple clusters, each serving corresponding country, or use the fact that everything in our application is local to a single instance of the app running within a JPM, and the fact that all of our routes are plain data structures, which we can compose, nest, and see from, and instead serve all the countries from a single application, We're using all code, being able to uh, reduce the number of machines we need overall, and simplify configuration, because now we don't have a couple of different instances, each configured to have different, to serve different uh, country and databases, because we store per database, uh, sorry, per country data and separate databases. We have a single instance which is connected to all the databases, but isolated, all the countries are isolated from each other. Um, porting the application from just German all five countries took two developers one day of work as a result. 
now that we know a bit about um, how the whole thing um, looks like and, uh, and uh, is architected, let's talk about deploying it. Our existing process of deploying our closure applications was rather rather heavyweight. We follow the standard procedure of creating a so-called Uber jar, and um, this Uber jar is basically a massive uh, jar with all of our sources and all of um, sources of our third-party uh, dependencies, etc. And, and uploading it to uh, all of our um, EC2 instances on which the application was running. Then we needed to uh, restart processes on which the application was running, and in case of applications which had a no downtime policy, we had to perform some juggling of the local parameters. This was semi-automated, which means it usually behaves semi-correct. We had problems with it to, to, to our entire process. On top of that, differences between um, production and, um, and uh, development environment made things also quite complicated, especially during troubleshooting and figuring out differences between that and production environments. We wanted something better. We came up with the uh, following strategy. We are uh, versioning, more or less semantically, sources, products, uh, sorry, sources, protocols, and core. On each push to continuous integration, when uh, a version is bumped, continuous integration automatically uh, rolls out a new release and pushes it to our internal labeling repository. Run depends on all those uh, three projects and is not versioned per se. Rather than that, it's deployed straight on master on each commit to run. So whenever um, there is a commit uh, ending up in the master branch, uh, for proper uh, dependencies of sources, uh, protocols and core are being pulled in. And um, our continuous integration system, after running tests, pre-compiling uh, our sources, and Pushing Uber jar to um, S3 notifies our uh, internal deployment tool to uh, deploy the uh, object in the S3 or the given commit. Then our deployment tool kicks in and starts the deployment procedure. For our deployment platform, we chose uh, Elastic Beanstalk. Beanstalk is essentially a layer on top of EC2, Elastic Load Balancer and a couple of other services. It's a uh, kind of platform as a service solution, which abstracts away a lot of details, giving you a nice, basic environment on which you can build your applications. Applications are running in environments. Each environment consists of a couple of machines <coughs> hidden behind a single, single load balance. Um, in case of Ogrom, we are running uh, two environments. One is serving requests and one is kept offline. I will go into details of how it looks in a second. Um, Elastic Beanstalk can run a couple of different um, application types, but the one which is particularly interested to, uh, interesting to us is Docker. We've heard about Docker already uh, today a couple of times, among other um, occasions in the keynote. Docker, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is essentially a tool which allows us to isolate our application in a rather uh, deterministic way from the rest of our environment and have a quite repeatable or a very repeatable uh, uh, deployment, uh, deployment, uh, deployments, um, both on the production and on uh, development. As soon as our continuous integration system uh, lets our deployment tool know which commit to, uh, to deploy, it sends it to um, AWS API, uh, which um, has, has proper, proper methods allowing us to uh, instruct Beanstalk to deploy a given uh, S3 artifact to a certain Beanstalk environment. Each of those uh, of EC2 instances, which are um, which belong to a particular environment, download the uh, Uber jar from S3 and start um, building a Docker image and running the application. Once our continuous integration system decides that, uh, I mean, 
it routinely, routinely checks that. But once it figures out that all applications are uh, running, all new boxes are, and or all boxes in the environment to which we're deploying have uh, the newest version running, it performs a swap at the DNS level, swapping the currently online and currently offline environment. As a result, all of our uh, newly uh, deployed boxes uh, start accepting uh, requests within a matter of roughly a minute. Um, on top of that, uh, we are adding one more layer. Both of our uh, Beanstalk environments are hidden behind CloudFront. Um, and since CloudFront is primarily well, a CDN, used to serve uh, static content. But it turns out that it's also quite a good uh, choice for a uh, RESTful API. Um, what it gives us is, um, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, obeying the cache control letters, allows us to um, uh, maintain a high quality of service even, facing, even when facing massive uh, load, which happens from time to time when we are sending out push notifications. Then we are, uh, well, we have to brace ourselves against the self inflicted distributed denial of service when uh, all of our clients are um, sending uh, many, many requests. Thanks to uh, CloudFront and its caching, we see roughly 5% of those requests. The rest is being served at the CDN endpoints geographically close to the user. Additionally, since uh, thanks to CloudFront, our clients do not observe our internal DNS changes our internal CNA changes. And uh, this uh, makes them uh, immediately switch from our old to newly deployed uh, version, even if the DNS server they are uh, using on their client side is, for example, uh, malconfigured and doesn't obey our uh, time to live uh, policies. This is roughly how we um, deploy and run our application. Um, now let's uh, take a look at what we've learned during uh, during uh, our work on this project and uh, what are our opinions so far. Um, we successfully shortened our feedback loops. Um, working in, uh, in with closure in general is well, it's it's a very productive environment to start with. Thanks to the uh, REPL driven development where you can very quickly get feedback from, from your system, you are already very, uh, I mean, you are basically operating within your uh, running running system and this really uh, simplifies your, and well, improves your development uh, experience. But thanks to the fact that we can deploy our code whenever we need to by simply pushing our newest code to master, uh, we get the feedback even faster. Um, we deploy on a productive day four times a day, twice before, twice after lunch. Yesterday, I think we deployed six times. Um, sorry? Um, problems, one problem which we have with our current ar um, infrastructure, uh, rather architecture, is uh, some uh, is, is a cost hidden in, in, the, in the split. Uh, we do have this uh, separation of, uh, uh, of concerns and separation of uh, logic responsible for uh, what's happening within endpoints and uh, uh, how the data should be stored in databases and then finally how the entire routing should be, should be executed. However, whenever you need to implement a single, a single feature, Sometimes you need to touch two, three, or four projects and go through all um, go through what well, submitting pull requests as we typically do. Um, this takes, or we imagine, this would take far less time if Ogron was developed within a single uh, repository and um, weren't that uh, strictly isolated into those sub projects. We still have to find a similar. Uh, Similar problem which we would solve in such a way, but without this, this split to uh, to compare those approaches. Docker 
also changed a lot uh, the way we run our code in production. First of all, this uh, this change gave uh, a lot of power to to the development team. Previously, all all what was happening on production was strictly uh, business of uh, of our operations. Now, developers are in control of what's uh, running in each uh, Docker container. They write specifications of those Docker containers, Docker files, if you like. Um, and this, of course, also <coughs> increases the responsibility, but thanks to being uh, less dependent on the operations team, they can introduce changes far more quickly, react to problems far more quickly, and um, well, we can basically experiment more. We also have uh, less expectations when it comes to machines on which we're running our, our application. We only need Docker and that's it. On top of that, Docker mm, made production environment and development environment nearly identical, which simplifies troubleshooting really a lot. There are some uh, trade-offs to this uh, deployment strategy. When it comes to something very specific, Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk, when running Docker containers, allows you to open only a single TCP port, which has to be your HTTP port. This doesn't sound like a large shortcoming. However, when you'd like to attach some uh, metrics, like JMX, or you'd like to do the same thing uh, uh, Stefan did in the previous talk, uh, remotely connecting to his uh, JPM over the N repo protocol, or if you like, development console over TCP IP to investigate the internal internal state of your uh, running application, this unfortunately isn't something you can currently do in Elastic Beanstalk, <coughs> at least according to my uh, latest knowledge. Um, our deployment under load still needs uh, some, uh, some polish. We need uh, to warm up our, our machines before we or we squish the traffic at the DNS level because um, at the moment we, when we switch, they are immediately hit with uh, large amounts of production traffic, which leads to an observable uh, slowdown of, of, of the entire um, API for a couple of minutes or a bit less. Also, the deployment still uh, can be can be made faster. Currently, it takes more or less 10 to 15 minutes from the moment you push the master until you see your changes live on production. Uh, we think we could shave up a lot of this of this time by, for example, um, uh, updating closure to the upcoming 1.7 release, which comes with some uh, interesting patches, reducing compilation time, as well as, well, um, hoping that JPM will uh, take a bit less time to start up uh, in the future. Um, another trade-off is the fact that there is no, <coughs> me, that there is no um, staging environment, which is not quite amusing for our valued Q and A team, but it allows us to um, iterate far more quickly and uh, push changes to production uh, to higher frequency. Overall, um, overall is an improvement. We. Um, we are happy with uh, how we um, work with it, with uh, how it is, uh, how it feels to develop it, how quickly we can change it. Um, our client teams, that is, uh, our mobile application developers, are happy with uh, both what they got as a result, as well as how uh, quickly we can respond to their requests, their bug reports, etc. Um, well, we had already some, some, some experience with closures, so it didn't, kind of, didn't come as a surprise to us that uh, Ogrim as well performs very well under, uh, under load, and uh, well, mostly thanks to, thanks to the underlying virtual machine and, and uh, closure. Um, we put uh, quite a lot of trust in this, because we already started um, migrating our uh, main web application, moving it away from directly accessing um, MySQL and um, Elasticsearch and letting it uh, speak to to Ogrom and make Ogrom a uh, complete facet for all of our data sources. 
Um, in future, we would like to um, investigate and take a closer look at how we could um, uh, how we could use uh, Ring Swagger in the context of our um, application. Swagger, in general, is a specification of um, API running, uh, API serving JSON, which when when your API follows the specification, you get a lot of tooling for free, things like um, documentation, things like uh, client generation, and other really nice, uh, really nice features. Ring Swagger is like a port of this functionality to Clojure. Uh, we're looking forward to Clojure 1.7. It should be coming soon. There are um, alphas released uh, and, and ready for um, ready for quick testing. Um, especially since this will reduce our uh, compilation times according to our tests on, on alpha versions. And um, rolling out our own Closure closure script API, which would um, simplify interactions with uh, uh, with the API for our clients, teams, would also uh, be an improvement. I realized that I didn't uh, say a lot about overall um, closure um, development feeling at the company and how we moved. Uh, uh, to closure, but there is a doc for that if you'd like to learn more about our path from uh, Ruby in our case to closure. I uh, invite you to take a look at uh, this doc where uh, I'm talking about the transition in a bit more detail. Um, this is uh, all I prepared, so uh, now I'd be happy to uh, take your questions either uh, now if we have some time, and uh, if not, then under following. Thank you very much. So, other questions? Did you ever run in the situation that you had to change the actual uh, schema and the data sources and so couldn't switch right away or something like that? Um, this hasn't had hasn't yet happened to us. So far with the each time we had something which could become a not backward compatible change in the schema of data source. We basically added it on top of existing schema, not modifying what's left. We yeah, we're basically not we're basically not modifying not modifying schema currently. That's all. I hope this answers the question. Yeah. Any more questions? When integrating all those like modules into a single application deployable um, Uber drive, have you ever encountered, encountered the problem that individual like submodules um, want to depend on different versions of libraries like that? This is one of the main points, pain points we have now in the project of our here, <coughs> like on the transition to more like microservice architecture because of that. Um, we are um, preventing this this from, or rather, when this happens, we are notified immediately thanks to this new line against um, strict mode, mm -hmm. where it detects whether you have um, line against is the closure uh, build tool, and um, it uh, has the setting which allows you to uh, abort whenever it detects that different dependencies require different versions of libraries, allowing you to have everything. Uh, requiring the same versions. Um, we, uh, I mean, when we, de we detect that, and how we, do we solve it, we basically keep, keep all of our uh, overall sub-protocols running the same version of all the dependencies if they need the same thing. And we haven't yet uh, run into complete road, road road blockers when we can't do anything because there is some uh, mismatch which we cannot fix. I do have a question. Uh, you said it takes about 10 to 15 minutes from pushing to master until it's in production. So does the, is there any testing in these 10 to 15 minutes? Yes, this, um, during those 10 to 15 minutes, we have uh, some integration tests running uh, against uh, production databases. Um, before this happens, all those sub-projects, all three sub-projects, um, have their own unit uh, unit level test suits which are run within their own release cycles before they are pushed to main repository. 
and but those tests aren't executed mm -hmm. during deployment. We assume that when it's released, um, it will stay green. But if I understood uh, correctly, you are deploying a web application. Yes, this is Don't essentially about somebody who clicks on the buttons and looks if everything works ex as expected. Uh, Ogrom is is um, hasn't got a UI, so to speak. It's it just serves JSON data over HTTP. So mm -hmm. this is very easy to uh, verify programmatically. Okay. Um, isn't it a really high risk to deploy Arcs that way? Because if I'm here, the developer just push something to Mars that will be deployed. I mean, um, we have. This is a great question. We have. Uh, these two things, two, two, two ways we deal with this potential problem. Um, first one is everything has to be uh, code reviewed, every change which goes to production. So at least, you know, two pairs of eyes are looking at everything. Uh, and other, always the second person uh, clicks the merge button. This, this, uh, this is very important. And everything else is being automatically reverted. Um, other than that, um, this the, after we swap the C name and the, old, the new version of the application is running, we keep the old one running. And this gives us this large red button being swap DNS back. We did it, well, we had to do it once or twice. And then within a matter of minutes, we're back with the old version. Um, so yeah, one is disaster uh, avoidance, one is disaster recovery. Uh, so far, we haven't run into many disasters. We are uh, trying to test the API uh, passionately in order to avoid this problem. I mean, as I mean, by testing, I mean automated testing, run in CI. Yes. Uh, you said you have to warm up the, the JVM before switching the DNS. How do you do that by uh, sending fake requests programmatically to, exactly. to get all the code path running? Exactly. Like this. I thought it was intriguing when you said that you test uh, using the production database um, before um, sending anything to the production instances. So how do you make sure that you don't break something in the production database? Where you test? I mean, there is always a risk. Is there some kind of uh, protection against uh, well, unit tests going, going bad? At the unit test level? Um, we are uh, mocking all data sources by, you know, injecting fake data, data sources. So that's, I mean, it hits production traffic uh, only once being ran on continuous integration. And at this stage, uh, we can surely run into trouble. Uh, this is a probability which we uh, cannot neglect, but um, all the all the um, disaster avoidance mechanisms like. Like code reviews, uh, like tests in Zika, and also not writing integration tests, which purposefully deep data uh, by random. We only, so to speak, first have a test which creates data, and another test which deletes data, so to speak. And this way, we didn't run into any massive, uh, any massive problems so far. So you have something like a fake account that you use uh, in those integrations? Uh, Precisely. Fake data cannot be seen by, by normal users. If you're posting a comment, it's visible in the system before you can delete it. We or posted it. Or we posted it under a uh, item we just created, and then we delete okay. it. So we hope it exists for so long, and I hope no. Let's assume it's it's just so ugly, no one will look at it anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just good at generating <coughs> such this data. Interesting concept. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Do we have more questions? Yeah, we have time. And no questions. But then this way or another, uh, I'm reachable, um, and it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. The uh, final words will be exchanged in this room, so you can just stay seated and wait until the other people join us.